Well, good morning, Brandon, North Georgia. How are we this morning? Doing good. There we go. I like that. Well done. I want to invite you all to stand with me this morning. This morning, Paul is going to be continuing on uh, in 2 Timothy. And we're looking about how our dependency comes from the Lord, how we can look towards him, how we can see him in his goodness, and how we can rely on his power um, throughout our life. And so this morning I want to read from Psalm 39, starting in verse 4. It says this, Lord, make me aware of my end and the number of my days so that I will know how short-lived I am. In fact, you have made my days just inches long, and my lifespan is as nothing compared to you. Yes, every human being stands as only a vapor. Yes, a person goes about like a mere shadow, and indeed they rush around in vain, gathering possessions without knowing who will get them. But it says this in verse 7, it says, Now, Lord, what do I wait for? My hope is in you. So that's our prayer this morning, that as we come together, that we look to the one, the author and perfecter of life, the one that gives hope, and that if it's been a hard week for you, if it's been a challenging week, that you look to Christ as your hope. If this has been a week that you've just been on top of the world, you've been feeling the, the Spirit move in your life, then praise the Lord and sing out of a heart of gratitude for that. But may we look to Christ as the author and perfecter of our faith and as our ultimate source of hope. I invite you to sing with us this morning. sins are washed away, not because of our good works, but only because of our Lord.
most gracious Lord, no tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to sing and, and as Joseph mentioned earlier you know I don't, I don't know how you you may have come in today um, there may be a lot on your mind there may be a lot on your heart there may be some of these moments right now in your life where it seems like the voice of the flesh is a, is a lot louder than the voice of, of God in your heart and in your life and, and maybe if you're like me you, you don't you don't need God every day <laughs> you need God every hour every moment every minute in order to help you, whether whether it's to fight off whatever is plaguing your mind, anxiety, temptation, you name it, or whether it's you, I mean, it is just hard for you to even get out of bed, and your heart's prayer is, I need you, and so I, I hope and I pray that as as you sing that song, not only do those truths that you sang resonate in your heart but that you are reminded that your plea to God to say I need you now he hears and he promises to be with you at every moment of your life and I hope that that's the case if you guys can have a seat we'll pray to that end here in just a few moments but as always we love the rhythms that we have here at Brainerd and one of those rhythms is to always put before you the importance of what it means uh, to give back to the Lord. And, and I'll tell you guys, I'm, I'm incredibly deeply thankful, not only to the Lord, but to the faithful givers here um, at Brainerd Baptist Church who continue to say, hey, what happens here at Brainerd Baptist Church matters. And we want to see, we want to see these ministries well supplied. We love hearing about kids ministry and student ministry and, and a host of other things that I can name that take place and happen here at Brainerd North Georgia um, and all across Brainerd Baptist Church that, that because of um, your faithfulness, they continue to not only be well supplied to flourish, but they are used as a means and a mechanism to further the name of Jesus both inside these walls and outside of these walls into Catoosa County and all across this globe. Right? And that comes through your faithful giving. Beyond that, we realize too that Giving is, is more and should never be even considered, honestly, as some odd transaction between you and, and the church. That's not what giving is. On the contrary, giving has everything to do with your worship unto the Lord, right? Because we, we acknowledge that everything that we have within our possession, the very job that God gave you to, to supply you well within your life is a gift that he's given to you. And so all of it, we acknowledge that it comes from the Lord, and, and we, 
we, if we were honest, it all belongs to the Lord because he's the one who gave it to us to begin with. And so when we give, it is a, not only an act of worship, but y'all, it is a posture of dependence upon the Lord that says, I know you've given it to me and I depend upon you to continue to, su- to, to, to supply me within my life. And it's out of that posture of gratitude that we give back to the Lord. Hence, why we believe at Brainerd Baptist Church that, that giving, giving is worship unto the Lord. And so we take the opportunity here, y'all, to not only express that, but then point to a, a way and a means, if you don't know uh, or haven't or have been thinking about how to give, well, on the screens there's a way for you to be able to do that both online or physically give here um, on this campus. And, and we want to put those in front of you so that as the Lord leads you and you give, you know how to. But then beyond that, we want to take the moment that corporately we can pray to ask the Lord to continue to cause his church to flourish and his name to be made known here and all across this globe. So why don't you join me in prayer to that end. All right, let's pray together. Father, we're thankful. We're thankful, Lord, that we can we can be reminded that when our hearts are heavy, when we're going through pain, when our minds plague us, when temptation is strong, we can cry out to you and say, I need you. I need you every hour of every moment of every minute. And I'm thankful, God, that as your word declares to us that there's nothing that can separate us from your love, that there's no circumstance that you can't speak to, that there's no moment that is an obstacle for you to be near your people. Be near. As your people cry out to you, show them your kindness and your love. Show them how good you truly are. God, thank you for how you have taken care of Brainerd. You are good. You continue to be faithful to her. You continue to show your faithfulness to your people. I'm grateful, God, for how you continue to well supply the ministries here at Brainerd North Georgia and all across Brainerd Baptist Church. We pray, God, that you would use and bless every tithe and every gift, every offering, and even the sacrifices that are brought to you for the flourishing of your church and for the furtherance of your kingdom. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said... It's kind of cool. I, I was mentioning this to the, the early service that um, I love not only what we do all across this world, but I love when new ventures begin in other places of the world. And, and I'll be honest, that's the first time I've actually heard uh, of some work being done there in that area. And so it's just really neat to see God continuing to open the doors in different locations and then furthering things in locations that we are already in. And, and it's just wonderful to be able to see how God's working in and through all of those uh, different locations. If, if you're ever interested, as I almost always say, right, that you want to hear more about what's taking place in these places or would like to get involved, please don't hesitate to connect with our missions department. We would love to not only give you information, but perhaps give you a means in order for you to be connected and then maybe, maybe one day uh, put feet in these locations in order to further what God is doing for his glory and for the advancement of the gospel in that area. So don't hesitate to ask, okay? We would love, love, love to get you connected with more information, all right? Okay, all that stated, you guys ready to dig in? Okay, 2 Timothy chapter 1 is where we're going to be at. 2 Timothy chapter 1, last week we were in the first seven verses. This week, today, um, we're going to be in verses 8 through 18, so we'll finish chapter 1 today, is what we'll do, and then onward to chapter 2 next week. As you guys are turning there, um, my, uh, my mother-in-law, uh, obviously Kay's mom, Kathy, uh, was kind enough uh, to be able to gift our girls something in Christmas, um, and it was a pass to get into Urban Air. And I don't know if you guys have seen or heard of Urban Air, but like, that would have been really cool if I had something like that when I was a kid, <laughs> that's for sure. It's, a, it's incredible what's going on there, um, at least to the level of what they have. And uh, mind you, we got that for Christmas. Talk about delayed gratification, right? <laughs> um, and then we ended up going uh, a couple weeks ago. 
And uh, it was just really, really, really cool to see uh, my girls enjoy that there for that day. It kind of did two things for me. One of them, it brought back some nostalgia. Uh, and the nostalgia was, I remember when my dad took me to a place down in Miami, Florida called Malibu Grand Prix. Grand Prix. And they had go-karts and a bunch of other stuff over there that you can enjoy and, and do, arcades, etc. And um, it was just neat because at Urban Air, they have, they have electric go-karts, which uh, that's new. Um, and uh, which is cool, whatever. But like I remember in the go-karts that I was in with my dad. And back in the day, you can mess with that governor, and they, they went a lot faster than those electric ones <laughs> in there. That's for sure, man. It was, it was fun. And it, it, it began to stir in me, uh, even as a, as a young kid, like a need for speed. Like, I, I loved it. And after that, it took off with me doing dirt bikes, uh, motorcycles, and even four-wheelers and everything else in between. I loved it. Like, I grew up on that stuff, which was awesome. And then the nostalgia was the fact that now here I am driving my oldest girl around that, you know, little raceway uh, and join that go-kart. Go, I don't know, whatever that thing is, the thing with electric stuff on it. Um, whatever. Anyway, it's one of those things where it was just neat. But then the other side of it is, like, I, I love seeing their new experiences that they got to enjoy. And one of those new experiences was the fact that they, they were, for the first time, doing rock climbing. And they got their harness on, they got hooked up and all the rest of that. And if you've never done that before, right, it's, it's a cool experience. For them, they had never done it. So they were really excited just to be able to go up one of the climbing walls or go up the little pillars that you can try to get all the way around in. But for them, like, all that they had in their mind at that very moment was up. They had not even thought about what happens when they need to go down. <laughs> right? Like, nowhere did it come and register to them until... Uh, one of them got halfway up the climbing wall, and then they looked down. They're like, uh-oh, right? And so, obviously, like, they're, they're hooked up to the harness. They've got a belt, they, you know. And it's the kind of harnesses that they will, they will slowly let you come all the way down, right? But, man, like, one of my daughters, she is glued to that wall. <laughs> she ain't getting down. And we're like, sweetie, it's okay. Like, just jump the rope We'll catch you. Like, it'll, it'll be okay. And you'll slowly make your way down. Like, it's not a big, you can rely on that thing. It's going to do its job. It's okay, right? And then sure enough, eventually, whether by fatigue or whether by choice, she came down, <laughs> right? And after that, it was off to the races, right? Like, they didn't care about going all the way up on the wall. They just wanted to get halfway up enough that they felt comfortable and just jump. <laughs> like, that's all they wanted to do. It was awesome, right? Now, Think of this for, for just a moment, and as you've entertained that, you know, fun story with me for just a few moments. Like, we have created devices for safety, right, so that you and I can take the risk of climbing a 30-foot wall and not have to worry about falling to our demise or our death, <laughs> right? Like, we have means by which we can rely upon something and then take that risk, right? Today, I've got a question for all of you that revolves around that idea of reliance. How do we faithfully obey the words of Jesus to declare the gospel, stand for truth, live with conviction, live knowing that we have a responsibility to declare the message of the gospel, knowing that there is a risk? How do we do that? We do that by relying upon the power of the Holy Spirit. In fact, I wholeheartedly believe that as we rely upon the power of the Holy Spirit, we are responsible for not only guarding and sharing the gospel, but doing so even, even if suffering may result because of it. Right? Now, don't believe me. Let me show you from the text how I believe that that is in fact true. Right? Read with me beginning in verse 8 of 2 Timothy chapter 1. Paul says, so don't be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Instead, share in suffering for the gospel, listen to it, relying on the power of God. It's another way of saying relying on the power of the Holy Spirit. He goes on to say, he has saved us and called us with a holy calling not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, 
which was given to us in Christ Jesus before the time began. This has now been made evident through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who has abolished death and has brought life and immortality to light. How? Through the gospel. For this gospel I was appointed a herald, apostle, and teacher, and that is why I suffer these things. But I am not ashamed, because I know whom I have believed, And I am persuaded that he is able to guard what has been entrusted to me until that day. Let's pray together. Father, we're thankful for the opportunity to be able to look to your word this morning. And I do pray, God, that all of us, even now, in the spirit of knowing what this text teaches, that we would be people reliant upon your work in our lives. That we would... We would hush whatever may be circulating in our minds and and allow your spirit to work, to be able to convict, to help, to encourage, to challenge. Capture, ransom our attention, even these next few moments, to your word. And God, I pray that you would even help me as I deliver your word this morning. We love you, and we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said... So I'll pose the question again, right, because I think it's worth asking. How? How do we faithfully obey the words of Jesus to declare the gospel, stand for truth, and live with conviction knowing that there's a risk? And we answered that question by saying that we need to rely upon the Holy Spirit, right? So let me show you how that's true with this outline. One, we rely on his power for gospel boldness and suffering. And then secondly, we rely on the Holy Spirit for gospel ministry. Okay, So on the one hand, Paul here is able to help us understand how we do something that's done to us. Okay, And then secondly, Paul answers the question, how can we do effective gospel, Holy Spirit-driven ministry in and through our lives? All right, let's start with this first one, which is we rely on his power for gospel boldness and suffering. All right, so just last week we learned uh, in that sermon that Paul's writing to Timothy while he's on death row. Dude is in a cold, dark dungeon awaiting to be sentenced to death. That's where Paul's at. And it's from that setting that Paul explains to Timothy who to rely on for gospel boldness and power in suffering, right? So that said, follow with me here, okay? There are two questions to consider and one very important truth right in the middle of it all. What are they? Let me give you the questions, the truth, and then the next question. Here's the first question. How do we suffer? We do so with his power. What's the truth? The truth is the reason, and you can almost insert this right in parentheses, in parentheses we should suffer is because of his great salvation. In short, Paul says, you want some motivation? I'll give it to you. And it's his death. Okay? Second question is, when do we suffer? And it's when we are faithful and bold with the gospel. So Paul almost puts it up front for us. Hey, there, there's something that all of us should expect. That if we're going to stand for truth or declare the message of the gospel, just know that there's something that may come in return. At times, great joy of seeing others come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. At other times, pushback, opposition. In Paul's day, harsh persecution. Let me begin with this first question. How do we suffer? We do so with his power. So, remember, Paul said, so don't be ashamed of the testimony in verse 8 about our Lord or of me, his prisoner. Instead, he says to Timothy, share in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God. Okay, a couple things. One, what does he mean by ashamed? What does he mean by sharing in suffering? Here, this word ashamed means to become characterized by feelings of shame or embarrassment. So Paul was encouraging Timothy, right, 
not to hide or withdraw from who Jesus is or his testimony because he might be embarrassed of both Paul or even Jesus himself. Right? Like, like this, is, this is Peter warming himself by the fire and somebody coming by and saying, hey, aren't you that guy that follows Jesus? And he's like, don't know what you're talking about. That's what Paul's like, don't avoid that, Timothy. Don't, don't, don't walk into that. Instead, he says, rather than being there, share in suffering with me. What does that mean? To suffer with one another, to suffer hardship together, right? It's, it's the mentality and loyalty that says, if you hurt, I'll hurt. If it goes down, I'm with you, right? I can't help but to think of some of those moments, Nick, like in F3 where we do, you do things together with the guys, right? Like you don't leave somebody behind, right? Go check your six, right? That's the kind of mentality that Paul is thinking about right here. Go find your other brother, bring them along with you. If they're hurting, we're hurting. We do this as a team. That's the mentality that Paul is speaking to Timothy about here, right? So he encourages to Timothy with these words, not because Timothy needs to be corrected. Don't get it twisted. Timothy's not doing anything wrong here. But to stay strong in his love and devotion to God. Paul, Paul wants to spur that in him. Stay faithful, Timothy, right? What's more is that Paul encouraged Timothy because he felt that what one day he was feeling, Timothy might feel as well. And what's that? Abandonment. Because Paul quickly realized that someone didn't want to associate with him anymore. They didn't want to associate with Jesus any longer. In fact, read verse 15 with me. It says, you know that all those in the province of Asia have deserted me. And then he, he brings to mind two people. Phygelus and Hermogenes. Those names resonated with Paul. I mean, these are people that he knew. I mean, think about this for just a minute, right? These would have been maybe the people that Paul went to Sunday school class with. We're in life group together, right? Like they were breaking open the, the, the new Lifeway material, right? And, and they, were, they were starting to read the new series on whatever individual put it out, right? Like that's where they're at. They had prayer requests together, right? Like they, they would have been the individuals that maybe just maybe asked questions to Paul after his sermon. And now they've deserted Paul in his greatest moment of need. This text, I think, would have resonated well with Charles Spurgeon. In fact, Charles Spurgeon wrote something in his book, Lectures to His Students. And specifically, what he started to do is he started to write to the pastors. And he wanted to bring to mind something that, that he himself felt and knew and understood. He said to his students, one, one of the most crushing strokes that it, it is often laid the minister very low is when a brother becomes a traitor. Right? Ten years, he goes on to say, of toil. Do not take so much life out of us as we lose in a few hours by those who betray us. Imagine these guys that would have done ministry together with Paul, imagine the moments that they would have had great conversations and all of a sudden it's, it's gone. I mean, have you ever been in one of those situations where, where you, you had a friend and y'all you, you were on the same page, you, you thought you had similarities, you, ha you thought you had, you know, everything was on the same page and then all of a sudden one circumstance, one piece of hardship, one piece of whatever, one disagreement and now all of a sudden the person you knew, or at least you thought you knew for 10 years, is gone. Like, y'all, that hurts. That's hard. Right? Because one would think that a brother is, as Proverbs says, is made for adversity. But then they're gone. 
John Piper, interestingly enough, commented on this particular section of Charles Spurgeon's life, and he said the following words. He said, the question for us is not just how you lived through continuous criticism and distrust and accusation and abandonment. It's not just that. It's also how, how does the preacher preach through it? How do you shepherd the heart of others when the heart is under siege and ready to fall? How, how, do you, how are you able to work with another individual, talk with another individual when your heart is broken? And it needs repair, right? He goes on to say, how do you live through calamity, disappointment, frustration, family pain, friendship pain, physical pain, public ridicule, slander, or even criticism? How do you do it? How, put it in context, okay? How on earth does Paul write this letter to Timothy, knowing that he's been deserted and he's on death row? How do you do it? How do you work on Monday knowing that your friend or your coworker that you thought you had a good relationship with and now things are rocky, how do you go in on Monday? How do you muster up the strength to say, I've got assignments that I've got to do, I've got things that I have to take care of when I know now things are different? How do you do it? Paul would answer and would say, by relying upon the power of God. That's how. But, but Paul, how exactly do you do that? Because yes, he gives the answer, but it's almost understood for Timothy. Because I would imagine that Paul and Timothy had these conversations of how do you rely upon the strength of the Holy Spirit? How do you allow the influence of the Holy Spirit to work in your life? And Paul would have told Timothy, one, Timothy, you have to believe what God says in his word. You have to believe in what the word of God says about his character. And you have to believe in what the word of God says to you about how God works in your life. So put it, put it at a foundational level, y'all. Is God good? Yes. Is he faithful? Yes. Is he loving? Does he know everything? Yes. Is he wise? Yes. Right? And is he near every believer who hurts? Paul would have looked at Timothy and said, I would, I, would not, I would not doubt, Timothy, that God is right by my side in this cold, dark dungeon. He's right there. And that's where I draw my strength. Why? Because there isn't a place or location that God is bound by. He's here. So for one, do you believe that? Do you believe that God is who he says he is and says what he says to you as a believer? Secondly, right, when we go to God, do we go to him as the very source of our strength? Or are we, are we really convinced that we're that witty and that motivated with our own strength? That we can just push through? Or are we willing to buckle at the knees and say, I need thee every hour? Like just like we just said, right? Thirdly, do we allow the Holy Spirit to influence our hearts and our minds with his truth? Like, you know how scripture speaks about that small, still voice that resonates with the truth of God's word? Where you allow him to guide you, lead you, and direct you? That's how Paul would say, that's how you rely upon, upon the strength of the Holy Spirit. Beyond that, he gives a great rationale. I, good night. I wish I can go on and on and on of this, but because of time, I have, to, I have to move quickly through this, right? But the reason we should suffer is because of his great salvation. Like, y'all, let me, let me bring it down to its core. We have been saved from slavery and from the darkness that, that we used to, that used to characterize our life. We, we were saved from sin and saved to God. And the reason that that is a possibility is precisely because Jesus made that available for us through his death. Right? 
Like, that's how it happened, right? So, beyond that, it's not just that God saved us from our sin, but what Paul brings up in this text is the reason we can also or should suffer is because not just of what God saved us from, but what he saved us for. Okay? John Piper says it this way, Christ suffered so that all your sufferings might be repaid with endless ages of joy in his presence. That helps you hold on, right? In short, when you know what awaits you for all of eternity and you know what you've been saved from, this life becomes but a momentary affliction because of what awaits you. And then, and then we come to the obvious. Well, when do we suffer, Paul? When we are faithful and bold with the gospel. Paul lived in a day when Christianity was not favored, but y'all, it flourished, right? Paul lived in such a way that on the one hand, yes, it was hard because of the intense persecution on Christians. I mean, Paul himself would be beheaded for his faith. Yet on the other hand, it would be the very persecution that would inspire and encourage other believers to be faithful to Jesus, right? Today, we may not experience that level of persecution, but our modern world continues to move further and further away from the truth. You match that with other teachings of Christianity that, that say things like, you know, God will never give you more than what you can handle, which is baloney. Or that Christians don't suffer. That's extra baloney on top of the baloney. Right? I love what J. Vernon McGee once said. He said, I'm afraid that at times some Christians are thinking like a little boy in Sunday school whose teacher asked, Johnny, which of the parables do you like best? And Johnny replied, the one where everybody eats loaves and fishes. J. Vernon McGee would continue on to say, my friends, the Christian life is not a bed of roses. We are to be partakers of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. So, a couple of things to take away from this, y'all. The way that we suffer is with his strength. The way that we are bold is with his strength, right? The question that should circulate in all of our minds is precisely what Paul would have asked Timothy and others. Are you ashamed of the gospel? Are you ashamed to associate with Jesus? Are you willing to suffer in boldness for the sake of the gospel? It's a question that all of us have to answer. Why? Because there is a cost that comes with following Jesus. Always is. So, for one, the text is, I think, abundantly clear that we rely on his power for gospel boldness and suffering. But secondly, we rely on the Holy Spirit for gospel ministry. This is the side of the text where when we are, we are told, we are called to be bold with the gospel, we rely on the Holy Spirit. Beyond that, when we are called to move towards people, we rely upon the Holy Spirit to do so. Okay, w Listen to what verses 13 through 18 say. It says, to Timothy, this is Paul speaking to him, it says, hey, Timothy, hold on. Hold on to the pattern of sound teaching that you have heard from me in faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Verse 14, guard the good deposit through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. You know that all those in the province of Asia have deserted me, including Phygelus and Hermogenes. And then notice the shift here. He says, may the Lord grant mercy to the household of Oniphorus. Because he has often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he diligently searched for me and found me. May the Lord grant that he obtain mercy from him on that day. You know very well how much he ministered at Ephesus. Now, a couple of things on the how we can do gospel ministry here, four of them, as a matter of fact. We rely on the Holy Spirit for gospel ministry for dedication, for proclamation, for protection, and for exhortation. There you go. I got all the shuns at the end there for you guys. 
think of this one of dedication. Paul charges Timothy to hold on to the pattern of sound teaching. It's from one pastor to another. Hold, right? That word hold means to remain in a certain state or position. To hold to what? Paul makes it clear. To the pattern of sound teaching. Well, that's cool, but what does that mean, <laughs> right? Interestingly, in the Greek, that, that word sound teaching, it's a combination of, of a word, carries the idea of being healthy. Did you know that? Sound teaching, healthy. The both are tied together. In other words, what's Paul saying with, with, to, to Timothy with that? He says, Timothy, do you know how you stay spiritually healthy? Remain faithful to the truth of God's word. Right? Do you know how a church, Timothy, stays spiritually healthy? Remain faithful to the truth of God's word. Right? In other words, Timothy, don't compromise your convictions. Don't compromise the truth. Keep the church and yourself healthy by actively teaching the truth of God's word. And I'll tell you guys, the further and further away... That churches go from teaching the sound truths of the gospel and the sound truths of scripture, the quicker they begin to evaporate. Churches cannot be built unless they are built upon the foundation of God's word. Everything stems from there. A healthy church is a healthy church because this is centralized and elevated. The moment that it is not, run. And go somewhere where they value the truth of God's word, right? Not only is it for dedication, but it's also for proclamation, right? Verse 13 also instructs Timothy that he's like, Timothy, one of the quickest ways that a local body of believers can become anemic is when a pastor stops feeding the church. You know how you guard the church with good truth is by proclaiming it. Don't. Stop preaching it, Timothy. Which means that, y'all, our job as pastors and as Christians is not just to stand firm on the truth, but to declare it. It's both. Okay? Beyond that, it's not just for proclamation and for dedication, but for protection. Notice what verses 14 and 15 say. It says, Timothy, guard the good deposit through the Holy Spirit who lives in you, who lives in us. You know that all those in the province of Asia have deserted me, including Phygelus and Hermogenes. So on the one hand here in the context, he gives a comparison. Timothy, you are to guard this versus those who chose to not guard it. Okay? I love what one commentator says on, on verse 14 about guarding. Timothy here is instructed to guard something, but what? Timothy should protect God's revealed word. How? By treating it like a treasure. Right? Something that has been entrusted to him and he needs to make sure to guard. Like, think of it this way. I'll, I'll never forget the day where my father-in-law, Greg, and I love him. He's, he's an awesome dude. I call him Bob the Builder. Um, it's true. And uh, I'll never forget the day where I'm, I was... I was you know, going going back home from visiting their house, me and Kay were, and he looked at me and he said, now Paul, like, just remember, you got precious cargo in that car. And I said, yes, sir. And he goes, you know what that precious cargo is, right? And I said, yes, sir. And he's like, she's sitting right next to me. He's like, you, you take care of that treasure, man. You protect my baby girl. And I said, yes, sir. Now, at that time, I was really scared of him because he's a military guy. He's NSA-like stuff. He knows how to research me. I'm like, this guy knows my social security number. He knows everything about me, right? We're, we're friends now. I love him to death, like, honestly. But do you get the idea? Precious cargo. Like, another way you can think of that is as parents, you know, that, that first time when you leave the hospital and you're like, oh, boy, and you have a kid? And you're like, I got to take care and keep this thing alive. <laughs> you feel the weight of that responsibility, don't you? 
Timothy would have said, how on earth am I supposed to guard this precious treasure? And Paul doesn't leave him without an answer. He says, through the Holy Spirit. So it's like, Paul says, I know you got a huge responsibility, but brother, you're not left without the enablement of God in you to work. He doesn't leave them empty, right? Beyond that, once Paul's done with Timothy, he's like, this is what you ought to do as your responsibility, but, but Timothy, do you want to see an example of how God takes care of his people and how God uses people both in word and in action to care well for his people? So he says, he says do you know how you see that? Through the exhortation of other believers. So he talks about this guy, Oniferous, right? And if you walk through it, this guy does justice to his actual name. Like, back then, names really did have significance and they had purpose behind Not to say that they don't today, but they were just heightened all the more back in the day, right? And so, Oniferous' name, according to John Stott, means the bringer of profit. He did not let down on his name, right? In fact, what do we find? We find in these verses how this guy was thoughtful. He went out of his way to say, Paul should not be alone. And I'm going to do everything that I can to find this man. In fact, y'all, like the text even says that he diligently, he diligently searched for Paul in Rome. Okay, like think of it this way. This guy was passionate to be able to say it means something to me that I find Paul. So this guy woke up with a mission. And he said, I'm finding Paul today. And if not today, tomorrow. And if not tomorrow, Wednesday. Like, I'm doing this. I'm finding this guy. And then he did. And what did he do? He spent time with Paul. He ministered to him. He loved on him. He prayed for him. Paul even says, like, that dude refreshed me. When in fact, he even edified me in days where we were in Ephesus. In other words, this guy was a friend, a brother to him. Like, like think of it, y'all. Have you ever had one of those friends that just caused your heart to be so encouraged and your heart so kindled for a love for God that you felt like you can just like kick down the door for Jesus? You're like, you mean, yes, man, I I wanna, I can do this. Or you you have one of your one of your one of your friends and she just comes around and you guys. It, it, it may be half an hour of hugging and crying, but man, it was awesome, right? And you just loved on each other. You prayed for each other. You have a, a friend that all it took was just five minutes of their time. And then you're on fire for God and you're ready to go out the door. You guys have friends like that. Do you see how God took care of Paul through the love and intentionality of other people, even in his hardest and darkest moment. And on top of that, Paul even says, that dude, when everyone else turned away from me, that dude was not ashamed of my chains. He was there with me. Y'all, I, I could not, I could not think of another greater gift that God gives to his church other than the very people that are sitting around you and how they love and care for one another. And I'll tell you guys something, here at Brainerd North Georgia, the kind of family am- atmosphere that I find here is beautiful. I love it. I mean, I, I even heard from yesterday of somebody who was just like, man, I needed that time with other folks. I needed it. Y'all, you have no idea whatever someone may be going through in front of you, behind you, to your right, to your left, what an encouraging word, what a thoughtful prayer may do. Like there's a gentleman in this church that for the last three or four years, without fail, Every Saturday, he shoots me a text, a text message that says, Paul, I'm praying for you. Paul, I hope to God that tomorrow you preach well, that people hear God's word, that people are saved. Every Saturday. And if there's a time that he misses, I'm like, hey, man, where you at, bro? You okay? Like, don't stop now, though. <laughs> <laughs> I, s- I still need your prayers, bro. <laughs> but it's amazing. But that, like, even with the gift of technology today, y'all, what an encouraging text message can do in the life of another individual. 
you may wonder, well, Paul, how can I minister to others? Pray for them. Love on them. Share with them God's word. Spend time with them. And it will mean the world to you. Right? Let me finish by saying a couple of things. One of them. Friend, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, one of the most encouraging and amazing things about Jesus is the following. That he was willing to know the sting of being deserted by his own friends in his darkest moment as Roman soldiers crucified him. He knows what that means and what that felt like. And friend, what if I were to tell you that for the joy that lay before Jesus, he endured the cross despising the shame. Why? So that you could be saved from your sins. What if I were to tell you that Jesus did that because he loves you and wants to free you from your guilt and from your shame? What if I were to tell you that he died for you so that you could be made righteous before a holy God and so that you would know that he wants nothing more than to reconcile you back to God? What if I were to tell you that he did all of that because he was willing to endure and suffer shame for you? Would you follow him? Would you leave sin behind and believe in him? Because that's what he asks of you. And so, friend, if you don't know Jesus today, I'll ask myself, would you today follow him? Would you today believe in him? Would you today leave your sin in order to be forgiven by him? Would you do it today? And then follower of Jesus, what if beginning today you say, my first step in making a decision, my first step in speaking with others, my first step as I go to work, my first step as I do ministry, my first step as I wake up on Monday morning is to go to the Lord in prayer and to ask him to influence my thoughts and my heart with his word. Imagine what this week would look like if you were to listen to that small, still voice called the Holy Spirit to lead you, to guide you, to direct you, and to challenge you and to help you this week. Imagine what your week would look like. And then imagine if Brainerd, North Georgia was known to be a people that lived in such a way that the people outside of these walls can't help but to declare that those folks in there rely upon the power of the Holy Spirit. Imagine what would happen. Let's pray. Father, we're thankful again for your word and we're thankful for another moment in time that we can be able to listen to the truth of your word. And, and I know, God, that I know that hearing that truth and knowing that there are many of us in this room that came with a lot on our minds, with pain, with difficulty, with the trouble of even thinking that tomorrow going to work is going to be hard, that this week's going to be hard. God, I pray, I pray that you would give strength, that we would be a people marked by relying upon you, that we would be a people that remember that you are not bound by location, you are not bound by circumstances, that you are near to every one of the believers that are in this room. That it doesn't even burden you, God, to know every circumstance, every hardship, every pain, every bit of anything that's going on in our lives. You love to hear it, and you love to be right in the middle of all of it. And so, God, I pray that you would shower your people with your presence and your goodness as they walk about their day and look forward to what is coming tomorrow and the rest of this week. Bless them. Go with them. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Let's all stand together. And hey, listen, these next few moments, the, the very song that we're about to sing may be your heart cry to the Lord. Use it as that opportunity to be able to pray to the Lord through song and sing to him what your heart wants to declare to him, that you need him, right? Beyond that, y'all, if you, if you need to come on bended knee, if you need a brother or sister in Christ to hug on you, to love on you, to pray with you, please don't leave today without knowing the thoughtful, kind love of another brother or sister in Christ that would want nothing more than to pray with you.
even even if it's like Paul, I can you pray with? Me? I would love to. I would love to spend time praying with you, so that you can leave encouraged, knowing that you're not alone, and that you have God walking with you step by step. Let's worship together. Spirit encouraging us as we go throughout our lives, as we look to Him in moments of suffering and moments of difficulty and great trial. But we also look to Him in those moments of joy, those moments of happiness. And this, the next part of this song says, if you're not here, God, I don't want to be. If you don't move, I don't want to move. And so may we be attuned to the Spirit's moving in our life. And when the Spirit says, speak, we speak. When the Spirit says, be still, we be still. And that we live in a way that brings honor and glory to the King who serves, who came to serve, who modeled service for us. May we live in a way that brings honor and ultimate glory to Him. So let's sing together.
Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for worshiping with us this morning. We want to leave you the same way we leave you every week, and that is to highlight kind of the top three things that are happening here at Brainerd Baptist. So number one, we have our Membership Matters. Uh, that is going to be this Wednesday at the Chattanooga campus at 6 o'clock. Personally, I have been very encouraged and uh, just really excited to see we have a lot of North Georgia families, couples, individuals that have registered for this upcoming uh, membership matter. So I just want to say if there's anybody, uh, anybody else, it's pretty much going to be a North Georgia, you know, uh, majority down there. So it's going to be fantastic, but really encouraging to see uh, more people from North Georgia just pursuing um, membership and asking what does membership look like here at Brainerd Baptist. So that's this Wednesday at the Chattanooga campus, 6 o'clock. Uh, number two, we have our ladies' brunch. Uh, you know, not as good as the men's breakfast that was yesterday, but um, the ladies' brunch. Uh, wow, jeez. All right, sorry. Um, but the ladies' brunch, if you would like to sign up for that, that's going to be a potluck style. Uh, ladies, uh, students, and up, please sign up out, right out there in the lobby. There's a little sign up sheet. Sign up about what you're bringing. It's going to be great. You have food, fellowship, and I think you're going to be able to hear a devotion from one of our ladies here at Brainerd, North Georgia. Um, that's this Saturday. So, number three, our parent commissioning is going to be taking place uh, on Mother's Day next month. It's going to be a fantastic opportunity for us as just our Brainerd, North Georgia family uh, to come alongside and celebrate parents who are committing their children to, uh, you know, encourage them and teach them uh, to pursue to know more about Jesus and to live a life pursuing after Jesus. So uh, that's an awesome opportunity. If that, uh, if that is something you are interested in as a parent, please go to the link at the bottom, brainerbaptist.org slash events. There will be a brunch at the Chattanooga campus on May 11th uh, that we are asking everyone to uh, attend uh, who, are, who wants to participate in that parent commissioning just as a way for you all just to kind of get a better feel for an understanding of what commitment that you're, you're actually making. But that'll be a really special time for us at North Georgia on May the 12th. All right, and then lastly, I want to leave us the same way that we leave every week, and I encourage you guys to say this along with me. May God be gracious to us and bless us. May he make his face shine upon us so that his way may be known on earth and his salvation among all nations. Have a great Sunday. Thank you all.